Welcome, RTO superheroes, to another episode of our podcast. Today we have a special episode where the tables are turned. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Lauren Hollows. Lauren is an educational visionary and a passionate advocate for building better education systems and services. She is the founder of Anywhere Education Services, and she's dedicated to providing quality, compliant, and accessible assessment tools to educators. With a wealth of experience in business coaching, team development, resource development, and RTO compliance, Lauren excels at identifying ways to improve and streamline processes within the educational sector. She is passionate about using education to make a difference, fostering staff engagement, and enhancing business maturity. Lauren is also the driving force behind Learning Lifelines, a not-for-profit organisation aimed at closing the digital divide and providing equal education and economic opportunities. She believes in the transformative power of education. Today, Lauren will be wearing the interviewer's hat and will be asking me about some of the exciting developments and challenges in the vet sector. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hey guys, this is Lauren Hollis from NOI Education Services and I am here with the wonderful Angela from Vivacity and Katya from Hawk I Can See. And we are continuing with Standard 4.2. If you guys have missed the first two parts, they will be linked either here, here, here or here. Still don't know where. Um, but you'll be able to check those out. If you haven't watched them, I do encourage you to go and watch them before. Guys, if you haven't, please do like, subscribe. It does help us continue to bring in all of this great content to you and all of our wonderful guests like we have today with Katja and Angela. Guys, we're going to get into it deeply now. And so I want to talk about ensuring cultural safety uh, for First Nations staff and learners. And again, I think this is going to look very different depending on the RTOs that we're working with, depending on the training products and the cohorts that we're working with. Um, but certainly this is definitely something we're seeing like nationally across a lot more areas of businesses in general. So I don't think it's a surprise for anyone. And I think that it is a good inclusion to to be ensuring cultural safety um, for both staff and learners. Uh, really interested to hear your guys kind of initial thoughts on this. Um, you know, again, it, you know, over, over inclusive, like, you know, over and above inclusive, over and above the policy, um, how do we how do we run with this? What does this actually mean um, in terms of you know I guess better for me this is about better participation um, and outcomes um, for 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 our First Nations staff and students. I know I feel like historically we are working with a group that has um, in some ways been over credentialed and under trained uh, because there's been so much money thrown at this area historically. Um, it would be really, I mean, I'm hoping and I know the intent of this is obviously um, to, to actually start providing like a, a it's a, it's an opportunity for more contextualized um, training and programs and things like that in my, in my mind. But uh, I'm here to hear what you guys think. So Angela, what are your thoughts? Okay, my thoughts. Uh, so first up, we identified in our team that a cultural safety policy and procedure will need to be put into place, uh, specifically addressing the cultural safety of First Nations staff and learners, so being aware of both and ensuring that it acknowledges and respects their cultural perspectives and needs. And I think, um, you know, as I said, I've said in previous episodes, uh, I think this is very interesting that this has come into the legislation considering it has been coming up in a lot of different training products where it is a requirement as a unit within the uh, training products. But also what I find very interesting is that this has been incorporated into our legislation even though we had our big campaign last year with the yes or no campaign when it came to um, First Nations and 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 having it as part of our um, you know legislation with with First Nations and that we got a no and now it's it's going to be incorporated within our legislation. So I suppose it's a different way of 
uh, focusing on it as not a yes or no statement, but more of a inclusive statement when it comes to including it within our policies and procedures and being aware of it, you know, you never know when you're going to have a First Nations person within your classrooms because not everyone identifies, even though they may have First Nations backgrounds um, as well. And one of the, one of the things, like I, for me, I've got very much involved with this because my husband's actually uh, First Nations background, so uh, he never embraced it as as a. Uh, when he was younger, but he definitely is embracing it now. And I think there's a lot of people who are discovering their roots uh, and learning a lot more about it. And I think it's because we are more aware as as a, a Australian culture, we're more aware of it now. Yeah, I think it, you, uh, it's actually a really good point, Angela, that you mentioned about the... Um, the vote last year, I hadn't even actually considered that. I was just thinking through my head when you mentioned it. I'm like, that's a really good point that it was voted no, but now we're starting to see it like being incorporated in different aspects, even though it was a no, um, which which is good. I definitely, um, I, I'm open for very much so. Um, I do believe it definitely a policy, how you're going to, you know, handle it, what you're going to consider. I think it needs to really needs to outline the a kind of to me when I think about cultural and in, in our workplace we're quite multicultural here and we don't have any First Nations people but we're from a, a diverse um, range of different backgrounds and for us it's all about shared respect and meaning and understand understanding each other's culture so a lot of the time people may not even be aware and um, so I think even if you can try and um sorry aware of other people's cultures try and bring in some experiences or potentially some learning and um, where maybe even a, a person in the workplace um, just talks about their culture and where they're from. Um, but how that looks for each organization definitely will be different depending on who you have access to. And um, we also did a cultural awareness day um, with a First Nation while I was a trainer and a setter. Um, but again, that depending on where you're based in Australia it could be different because there's you know so many different tribes and communities and um, so just making sure that it is appropriate and definitely asking your students or your staff like asking them how can you better support them I think is really important on understanding their needs and truly listening to what it is they're asking for as well and um, but yeah I, I definitely welcome it I probably am a bit unsure as to how fully that or what implications this might have on an RTO and and how I suppose as we're going to audit them on this but definitely a policy and, uh, and procedure and make sure that you're actually following that policy and it is you know reflective and aligning to the practices that you're going to undertake don't say all these amazing great things if you're not actually going to do them make sure that you are doing them one yeah, I thought I had one thought I had is would we would part of this be that we need to do an acknowledgement to country? Oh, at the start of training or set or anything. Mm. Yeah, see, I, mean, I think I'd like it's it's an interesting one. We um we've been currently we've been writing a lot of um we've been working with a lot of great organizations. Um uh, massive shout out to everyone um and car tech training, who are both organizations that we've been working with directly on developing a lot of training i i mean for me a lot of this comes into the fact that we're seeing in a lot of different training packages um work effectively with diversity work effectively with aboriginal Torres Strait islander units and one of the things that we've been doing is we've been rolling out some of these training packages and writing some of these materials with the industry experts is they're turning around and going yeah this unit's not actually written like this unit is written for a very particular group, but it's, you know, it's not really thinking about how how this is going to particularly work when we're putting it in into practice in this particular environment. Um, and you have so, so many I different think, cultures as well. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think it's about, you know, it's about thinking about when we're actually building um, when we're building training materials and we're going to be working with with particular cohorts, yes, we've got a responsibility for industry engagement, but I think this takes it to a wider stakeholder engagement. And I mean, 
we've been very fortunate to build, um, you know, training materials, uh, you know, that have like all the, like all of the content that we've built has come from industry consultation with, you know, uh, like with elder reference groups and stuff like that. So we've taken all of their knowledge and put that into the training materials. And like, we've recorded their, we've recorded their sessions and taken direct quotes to build into the training materials. But um, it's one of the first times that we've really been able to like have um, those reference groups and those elders actually lead like the direction of the, I guess the direction of the training and have their voice lead the direction of the training. And given how long we've been like writing these, you know, generic units in industry, I think one of the interesting standards is going to be, I mean, if you're a resource provider who is writing cultural safety units, who are you actually checking to make sure that they're culturally safe? If you're delivering cultural safety units, who are you actually getting to check to make, to like, to, to check that particular content, to check the actual trainer, um, is an appropriate person and knows how to deliver that training in a culturally safe manner. Like, I think that it's about getting, um, you know, if, again, if we're training, uh, if we're training horticulture, we need to be talking to horticulturalists. If we're training cultural safety, we actually need to be talking to people who work in the domain of cultural safety to, you know, say, yes, that is safe for my culture. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think that's a big component that's been missing from a lot of the, like a lot of the units and a lot of the training that we have had out there before. So we'll like tie it all together, really. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like how many qualifications now have got diversity units in there? I'd, yeah. I'd argue vast majority of them, right? Yeah. But like yeah. how many of how many RTOs that are delivering that are really just delivering something relatively generic? haven't actually engaged with any other cultures to see whether or not. It's a disconnect. It's a disconnect with the RTO and the training. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Specifically tailored to their needs then, Ray, if, if it's not been checked to ensure that. Mm. There should yeah. be that for layer. So I think, I think that, I mean, for me, I think that's, it's going to be really interesting to see like how that gets rolled out across a lot of things. I think it's similar to like that well-being issue of like, if we're gonna if we're gonna be training if we're gonna be ensuring well being, um, you know we went through all of the training packages and we've kind of identified two units that are all about supporting personal well being. So for me, a lot of my RTOs incorporating well being into the discussion and, and evidencing how we you know support learner well being, we're actually adapting our unit selection to include. A, a unit on how to manage your health and well-being and incorporating that into the vast majority of qualifications because what better way to evidence that you're supporting learner well-being? And I think by incorporating that cultural safety policy and procedure, um, not and, and it's it's First Nations, but it's also looking at all cultures, I think, that we need to have within our policies and procedures, but it's going to tie better with the, those units within the training packages. And people like the team, your, your staff are actually going to go, oh, okay, this is part of what we uh, have in our policies and procedures. Now I can understand the connection to the training. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that what's it called? Um, like health is a really, in health, health and community services are a really interesting area. You know, if you're delivering to international students and you're talking, I mean, the way that in the West we're comfortable talking about, you know, men and women's sexuality, that does not cross across the vast majority of cultures. So, you know, when a training package requires you to cover X, Y, and Z, but like culturally, you know that that's going to work out differently. How do you discuss that? How do you build that into your tasks? I think like these sorts of things are going to definitely come more to the forefront based on what we're seeing in like the political sphere. Yeah, well, it's I'm wondering pretty- what's going to happen with pronouns. And um, oh. like, I, I know big thing for me is I've got, we've got family members now who um, who don't I identify don't like- as he, he, her, he, him, she, her, and uh, bringing in pronouns. I'd like to know like where this will fit most probably the next one protect learners and staff from harassment and discrimination 
Um, but where will they have that within uh, in our training, but also within our requirements and policies and procedures when it comes to respecting individuals? So it was interesting that you brought that in, but it's, it, there is so much more than just First Nations. I think it's very important that we're bringing First Nations in, but there there is also a, a whole heap of other culture and pronouns and things like that that we need to bring in as well. I think a lot of that, I mean, for me, so much of that just boils down to can we build respectful relationships with our learners? And I find that in the like in ninety percent of cases, in my I don't argue ninety nine percent of cases, right? If I come to you and I treat you with respect as a person and you come to me and you treat me with respect as a person, you know, we'll both, we'll all make the efforts to like, you know, use and and refer to each other how we all prefer. Um, And where we make a mistake, we understand that, you know, people are going to make mistakes because human language evolves and, you know, it's harder for some people to keep up with that than it is for others. Um, I... To this day, I still refer to everyone as sir and ma'am. Like my U.S. culture, my U.S. upbringing, I've smashed it into my boys. I'm like, nope, if you come across it, you go, I'm sorry, sir. And you go, I'm sorry, ma'am. You know, like and I step out of the way. So my Southern kicks right on in, um, you know, and I just kind of go, as long as everything is brought with that idea of, you know, I respect you, you respect me, we're all going to do our best. I think the 99% of trainers, if you can set that up in your classrooms, we're going to be okay. I think the challenge comes into it where from day dot, there's respect is not happening on either side. And so there's no discussion. There's no discussions about like accountability, roles, responsibilities for like students or for trainers. And that's where we get into really challenging issues of like everyone kind of just sets up their own rules and does their own thing rather than having a group discussion about how we're going to tackle these problems within our organization. What are your thoughts, Tasha? Come on, get yourself in trouble. We've already gotten ourselves in trouble. Right? Get yourself in trouble. We've got ourselves in trouble. So <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to add, I think, um, from what you mentioned about pronouns and stuff as well, and just to add on to that, I thought it was really interesting like what levels of resources and support services on top of that we then need to consider. So not only for First Nations, but even, you know, for other culturally different people and what to what level, like are we going to have to implement counselling services? Is there going to be mentorship programs? What does that look like and what are the additional costings? Um, and I don't know if they're necessarily – there's a lot of guidance there, and um, but my one mind wanders into those other aspects too. And I just wanted to add that I think it would be good if there was a bit more clarification um, around, I suppose, yeah, this the resources or the expected length that um, providers are expected to go to to really support um, students. And that, yeah, I mean, very that's interested depend on the the intensity of the course, right? Like, surely. You know, if you've got a student in your class for two years as an apprentice versus if you've got somebody in your class for six hours doing a short course white card, the level of responsibility is going to be different, right? Absolutely. Well, you would assume, yes. And it has always been, like I know when I had my RTO and I had uh, full-time students who were there for like um, three, four days a week for 10, 12 weeks, compared to one day, uh, very different how we do induction because you're only they're only there for a day and you're going to have different types of issues from the different learner cohorts. But going back to what Katya said, um, one thing that uh, will be very interesting is what comes up in the user guide from ASPA. Mm. How are they going to address this? Yeah. yeah. And I think, but again, like, you know, the, I think this kind of goes back to within the standards, RTOs have got to say, for example, what wellbeing support services they're going to offer, right? When we then take that into account with fairness and equity, is it fair that we turn around to someone and go, well, if you're in a short course for six hours, this is the services, this is the wellbeing support services that we're going to provide you. If you're in a course for, you know, a week, this is what we're going to like, you know, does an RTO need to start going down to that level? 
Um, you know, is there going to be a challenge on, on on fairness and equity if you go, well, hold on, I'm I'm paying you, I'm enrolled with you. During the time that I'm enrolled with you, you're telling me I only have access to this, whereas this person who's enrolled with you, because they're enrolled with you for a longer period of time, they get access to this, right? Is that going to potentially be an issue? You know, is it not an issue as long as RTOs are really upfront about it? I think some of these things are going to be the like what's going to come out in the wash, you know. I'm interested to hear like what your guys' thoughts are on, you know, would that be like I, I, I feel like it's a fair thing to say, well, yes, if you're only with us for six hours, this is kind of really all you get access to. If you're full-time, you know, over this period of time, if you're enrolled in a full qualification, this is what you get access to. What are your thoughts on that? It's definitely interesting because someone who's maybe doing something like a short course, they need it for a job. RSA is a good example. I think they're what, 30 to $40 um, per certificate. A, a student logs onto an online pl platform and they do it in, you know, a few hours. And I think the, the margin on what the RTO is making is already quite potentially minimal. Um, and then if they then have to provide the exact same services, let's just use a, a counsellor as, as an example. If they have to have a, a counsellor available to that student, that's going to cost them more than what the student would have paid to enrol. So th do they then need to up their costs to cover that potential counselling? And um, that, you know, and then that gets impacted onto the student because they need to pay a higher rate for the course. And um, so if it opens up for that too. It, although we're supporting the student, are we then actually hindering them because potentially we need to cover some additional costs. Now, I'm not saying in all instances that's just a, a very short RSA course where it's quite cheap and I think providers have to keep it lower, um, you know, because there's quite a lot of them in the market. But it, it's definitely interesting. Do they then need to also almost create these baskets of support based on whatever the student's enrolling to? Um, I, I'm not sure. And does that then in, ca call into fairness and equity? Because technically they are students, so they should be entitled to the same level of support another student gets. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I think um, the most important part with all of this is training the trainers and the staff making sure that they have a good understanding of what cultural safety is. Um, we need to start with the team and, and our trainers and assessors first and make sure that they have a good understanding of what does it mean to implement cultural safety within the RTO. And if once they've got it and you've got that as part of your culture in your organisation, then it will just, it won't matter how long your students are there for, whether they're there for a day or they're there for a year, because the trainer and the staff and everyone involved in the organization has this part of their culture in the organization, it will it will pass on to the students. So I think the important part is firstly training staff and uh trainers and assessors, then secondly bringing it in for learners and students. Um, one thing that I used to do when I had my RTO for a one-day uh, course or a short course, we used to just run the induction video on a loop at the start of the training and the trainer didn't go through it. So the students could read it as they came into the room and as we got set up, that was just running in the background. Whereas for longer courses, um, if it was, you know, two weeks or more, we'd actually do an induction section session and we would adapt the adduct, induction depending on the training, training the, the course that they were doing. So it would be induction into the RTO, but it would also be induction into that training, uh, that industry sector, for example, aged care. So it might be we do induction to the RTO and now this is an induction to what to expect with this training and working in the aged care sector. So I think it can be adaptable without too much of ex expense, uh, but the most important part will be the training of the team. Right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. So uh, 4.2, if you had two minutes to provide advice to RTOs on what they need to be doing in relationship to this standard, uh, what should they be doing? Angela, I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> 
Uh, I think the first thing you need to do is start doing some research into uh, like what policies and procedures you would need to in, in, integrate into your organisation. We've already identified a number of policies and procedures that we would implement uh, into our organisation or into our policies and procedures. Uh, so it's really reviewing what you've got now and what you may need to include. So if, like, I, I know we've got a lot of clients who are, are, are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander um, RTOs, so they specifically deliver training uh, for First Nations. So they would already have policies and procedures in place for First Nations. We've got clients who work in the disability sector who would already have policies and procedures around disability. So it's really reviewing your current policies and procedures, see, see where the gaps are and what you'll need to add in. Um, there will be a lot of RTOs that won't have First Nations and they won't have disability, they won't have policies and procedures around that, and that's where I encourage you. You'll need to um, do some research into it and then write policies and procedures on it. We're already doing that. We're already doing the research into all of these areas and already rewriting our policies and procedures in accordance with these requirements. Excellent. Katya, over to you. Yeah, I completely agree with well, Angela. Definitely looking, um, try not too much to reinvent the wheel. Definitely look at what you've already got. A lot of providers already have a lot of, or potentially a lot of these policies and do research into what it really means and it, collaborate with your staff as well get their feedback on what should it, it should be incorporated into the policies and make sure that once they are developed that you're training your staff on them they're aware of what they mean and um, add it into your recruitment processes or your hiring process for onboarding and um, also collaborating with the First Nations people and culturally diverse people as well. If you can get a local elder involved in reviewing any policies, I would highly recommend doing that too. And, um, you know, seeing if, if there's any insights um, into their needs or their perspectives maybe that you haven't considered in your policies. Um, and then having some type of um, like, suppose culture of promoting inclusivity within the organization maybe it might be like uh, i don't know um having a monthly catch up with someone and someone shares what they're doing that month or what their cultural background that month and um, learning so that you're continually um fostering that culture of inclusivity and diversity and then documenting so anything you're doing make sure that you're documenting it and this all becomes gold and evidence for when we go to audit so if you're having meetings or if you're having those catch-ups with staff if you're reviewing your policies try to capture it somewhere in your continuous improvement register or whatever it is that those mechanisms you use to, to capture that improvement just so that you can be confident and when you go to an audit that you have done it and it's all in one place and you're not scrambling to get it um, and then yeah continue to update them or regularly review them and good luck. <laughs> Excellent. But I'm, I'm, right. very, I'm working, looking forward working, to them coming out and we can actually... Working in, uh, in reverse, Katya, if uh, our audience wants to find you, where can they find you? Um, well, you can find me on hawkeyeconsultancy.com.au and you can also... Um, Find us in Southport. We're located on the beautiful Gold Coast. Um, I am on LinkedIn. I'm probably not as um, on it as as often as I would like to be, but you can also catch me there. Um, and I have a wonderful team. So if you ever need any help, just call the office and someone will pack me, uh, it on to me. But thank you so much for having me. And all of those details will absolutely be below. Angela, where can we find you? Okay, so you can find me on LinkedIn. I am pretty prolific on LinkedIn. So Angela Connell Richards, I am the only Angela Connell Richards on LinkedIn. So you won't find it hard to find me. Uh, so love for you to connect with me. Um, in particular, we're doing a lot of discussions around the new legislation, the vet reform, uh, not only this, but the workforce development planning and those sort of requirements as well. You can also go to vivacity.com.au and 
And I would encourage you to join the RTO community group, which is on Facebook. So if you look up the RTO community, uh, continue the conversation there and join like-minded vet leaders who are also very passionate about the training industry on our uh, RTO community uh, group. And we also got the RTO job board. Thank you for joining us at the RTO Superhero Podcast with me, Angela Connell Richards. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Each rating and review helps me fulfill my goal of helping training organisations around Australia to learn and grow in compliance and business success.